Viewer discretion is advised. A warm welcome to a beautiful day here at Ambion Dingala. And we're currently sitting at a water hole with quite a few animals coming down to drink some wildebeest, waterbuck, and also some giraffe, and then some hippos in the water. So I'd love to encourage all our viewers, come join us on this live safari here in the African bush. So there's the giraffe you can see just behind the bushes making its way closer towards the water. Now it might be because it's a nice warm day that this giraffe is coming all the way down to come have a drink before it eventually moves off. Now we didn't see it drinking earlier on so I'm assuming that it might just find a nice spot to eventually uh, move towards and then also um, some of the other animals that we'll hopefully point out soon. Um, but I'm Nikki here at Ambion Lingala, so I'm going to be a ranger for this afternoon and with me on the camera is Gert. And uh, as we were mentioning, it's such a beautiful day, there's a, a few giraffes um, just behind us, hopefully they'll come down to drink, but just want to point out to some of the other animals that we uh, currently can see from the, our view here. Now you'll see right there in the middle is a blue wildebeest making its way down. I don't know if they've already had a drink or maybe still on their way to come and have a drink. But often this time of the day is when you don't really look out for predators because they'll be finding a nice um, spot somewhere in the shade to lie down. Where some of the more common animals like the wildebeest, possibly giraffe, zebra, kudu, um, they'll come down to drink. So what we're trying to do is just trying to see if we can get some of the other animals, but they blend in so well, especially when they do move in behind um, some of these trees. You'll notice most of the trees have lost their leaves and it's that time of the year. We had a bit of rain and hopefully we'll get some soon again. And who knows, within the next couple of months, this whole area would start greening up quite a bit. Jumbo Jumbo and hello, hello everybody. A very good afternoon uh, from the Maasai Mar of Kenya. We have uh, lots of rains here. You can tell the grass is quite green and we got a pair of lions here that are having a nap. And it's a very good way to start our afternoon drive. A rather warm afternoon here in the Maasai Mara. We're talking of 26 degrees Celsius or 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David, and on camera I say Bungay. Bungay is very excited because this particular lions that are here, he loves them. And it's today that he'll be asking why he thinks they are the best, or is the best pride of lions in the whole of Masimara. Now, this particular pride here is called the Mogoro pride. And it normally has two girls and one youngster male. The one farthest to your screen there is a young male. And you can tell how sleepy they are, which is very typical of lions. They're not very far from this particular area this morning, and they have remained here because there's a pool of water not far from here, and I'm sure they would want to lay ambush to any would-be prey that would come to drink some water. As you have already heard, should you have any questions or comments, please send them through. We'll answer them in real time, and you can tweet to us, hashtag World Earth. Hello. Now, you notice it's a male and a female, and people have always thought it's males that just sleep. But even the females, with the right conditions, will also have an app. We'll give them a couple of minutes and see if they're going to raise up and shine. If they don't, I'll be moving on to find out some other active animals on the way. Jumbo, 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 jumbo. Uh, good 
afternoon this afternoon it's another lovely time that we come back to you my name is isaac and on camera i have big james and already we are at our location here in the mara, mara triangle ready to show you what we have found for you guys to start with i have the Maasai giraffe, which is the only kind that we find here in the Maasai Mara. Remember to talk, to, you know, to us on hashtag Wild Earth. Questions and comments are very, very welcome. This is a live broadcast. You can also, you know, watch us or, you know, live stream on YouTube. I have a good number of them here. These are the Maasai giraffes. And uh, this is uh, definitely a male. You can tell by, you know, he's got those thick, Is that Lucy Jumbo? You ask, you know, what are the giraffe horns used for? To start with, there are no true horns. As you can see, James, thank you. And as you can see, when James zooms in, they don't have the dark color that all the horns has. Um, this is a skin around bone, and they are bare on top. These are called ossicons. They are not true horns, but yes, they do have uh, a job. They are used for defending one another during fights and also, you know, for knocking one another, you know, down. Those are very lethal weapons when they are fighting. They sometimes hit each other so hard that they lose, you know, they make the other one lose its balance. I don't know if you notice how, you know, the giraffe is able to almost stretch you know, its head straight, same as the neck. It's quite an unusual thing. Not very any many animals can do that, and that's because it's got a well-adapted, you know, vertebrae towards where it attaches to the head, able so that it's able to reach even the highest leaves in a tall tree. And if it's not able, it can push out its 18-inch tongue to be able to you know, pluck leaves. It's a browser specially adapted to eating leaves. Look at its prolonged muzzle. It's pointed and it's got leaves, you know, lips for plucking leaves. And that pointy, you know, structure is for penetrating inside bushes. Just imagine if it was flat, thick, it would, it would definitely, it would be very definitely difficult to get inside bushes. And I think he knows I'm talking about him and as I watch him, we're going to take you to another location where I have my colleagues. Well, these lions with the choice of a little bit of zebra or a giraffe, they'd go for the small animals. But now I'm sure you all know in the Masimara, we still have the migration. And as soon as the migration clears and heads back south, they'll be left hunting animals like giraffes. I've just been hoping uh, these two uh, lions here, one of them will wake up and shine. And not sure that Bungay will show you the pool of water I was talking about earlier. And I would say they're just having a nap here or they're where they are for a reason. Number one, of course, the vantage height of being on some sort of tumid mount where they could scan around the savannah and see for anybody maybe coming to have a drink there. I mean, the animals around here, be it giraffes or zebras or wildebeest, they'll know they'll come for a drink. But very interesting because not very far from where we are. All right, these are the spa-winged lapwings, three of them. Spa-winged lapwings, and you could just hear them calling, I'm not sure why they were calling. Are you cutting or you're getting one? These particular lapwings are very territorial. And I think the third one either was being invasive and the two have combined forces to show her the door or him the door. Now, straight ahead from where I am, I'm sure Bunge will show you that we've got the two lions here, the male and the female, but apparently in a distance of about, what, 100 meters away, we've got some two huge buffaloes. And I, I want to believe they're not having a nap. Now, remember, we are coming to you live from the Masui Mara of Kenya.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in Service Saint. Pretty shiny, which is our degrees today, 27 degrees, 80 Fahrenheit. And we're looking now at this beautiful herd of buffalo right on front of us. Looks like uh, this is what they're going to be standing for us. And I'm Andrew behind the camera. That's BK. So the buffalo, there are our grazer, which is a mix kind of a herbs and grasses around here. So, of course, it's been a while since I seen a buffalo. I was talking to BK, I mean, why did we miss them this morning? And it looks like, I don't know, maybe they were not in the property. We're in the northern, northern boundary of Juma here, where we believe they might maybe come from either Manuelitigum Reserve or those regions, I think so. They're kind of a very hard animal to find because they move in such a herd. We don't have many of the herds here like we used to. And understand that there was a lot of a drought for the past few years. A lot of them have died. And that time we used to see different herds coming in and out of these reserves. And until then, all the number has went, but I'm glad that, you know, every raining season they breed, these, these animals they breed. So it means that the number now has been recovering a lot. It's quite a beautiful herd. So it looks like all of them coming back to the area because of the grazing. Grass is a serious measure and of course they can little browse. Hyla, how horns a buffalo ha horns heavy? So I'm not sure how heavy they are, but the head itself, all of it, can be anything from what, uh, 40 kilogram, 60 kilograms, somewhere around there. So I'm not sure about the head, I'm gonna just double, double check on that. But of course these males, I mean, oh, they grow such a massive horn, bolted horn, as you can look at this one, chilling out chewing a card. So they are ruminate just like a regular cows at home. And they're also toughest animals out here. These in the group, they can able to work together and protect together. And they can face the danger, which it's actually men danger lions out here would hunt this such animal. Other than that, natural disease, or but the young one can get hunted by if it's a chance of male leopard around and then of course left behind and they still get killed, but not a bigger one, too big for the leopard. So lion will be dealing with this one. And a fully grown male can weigh about, what, 800, 800 kg, so that's a weight of a regular male and a female somewhere 750 kg so they're quite big you know they would leave somewhere around lifespan it's about with 23 years 25 years they are savannah buffalo african buffalo which you can see in there so we'll wait around here, see if they all come out of the bush.
Hi everyone, welcome to a very hot afternoon on Chitwa. Chitwa this afternoon. We are admiring some Inyala. Gorgeous. They've got youngsters everywhere at the minute, which is perfect, but not ideal because the dogs are around. My name's Lauren. I have Theo on camera. The dogs are somewhere here. It's the Pungwe pack that we've been spending a lot of time with, but I just don't know where they are. They're not in the same place they were this morning, and most likely because it's incredibly hot. It's a really, really hot afternoon. In fact, it's the hottest afternoon we've had in a while out here. So these Inyalas better be careful. We had the most incredible experience last night when the Pungwe pack chased a young Inyala into the dam. The Inyala swam all the way to the other side and it just goes to show all animals can swim when they have to. It's really humans and other primates that can. Well, we can when we learn, but these animals can just do it automatically. So we're just going to keep scratching around Chitwa. It's a really beautiful day and hopefully the dogs will appear. I imagine they'll be tucked away in the shade and because they are quite small and petite, they'll probably be invisible for a while. I really hope Lauren is able to find those wild dogs, but here we found Pretty amazing little antelope that you don't really uh, see in the day. Or if you do see them, they don't stand still for too long. So it's a little steam buck. So if you look at this one between the ears, you'll notice there's no horns. Um, so it is a female. And look at what she's doing now. So basically, she, probably after the rain, there's a lot of green um, grass that's uh, shooting out of the soil. And so she's going and picking that. And for her, she needs... Um, to have a, a diet with a lot of nutritious value, so she'll be very selective in what she eats. But how beautiful is the colors? Look at that bright white belly. You'll notice a very short tail. And especially now, during what's a very warm part of the day, how she would be feeding, just because the predators won't be out now. So even like those wild dogs, they won't be running around. They'll be lying down somewhere in a bush, to cool down but how amazing is this just to enjoy it It's incredible you'll notice if she carries on the way she does like she can easily disappear behind the smallest of shrubs jumbo jumbo a different area of uh, the mara only about two kilometers from where i saw the giraffes i've come across this beautiful dazzle of zebra look at that pattern on that big you know female there you know it's quite interesting they say that none you know none in none of the zebra are the same in prints they're always very different and you can you know have a quick look at those you know lined up there their backs you can tell they're quite different and it's quite unique very much like our finger prints very much the same to the giraffes so there's no the two that are the same these guys are part of the annual wildebeest migration or the migration if i may put it and you can tell they are in their hundreds everywhere in front where you see them and way back is just a zebra 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 they usually come in fast during the migration and then the wildebeest follow the brownish color on the one to the right means she's been wallowing sometimes they dust bathe and while doing that sometimes it's wet so it gets you know caught in the coat and they look like they're different but it's the same same you know bachelors zebra they are in their hundreds very many even some on the road uh, over there you know that is a beautiful view look at that sonia Jumbo, you ask if the zebras migrate more than the wildebeest, they do the same. 
um, when the wheel beast uh, move the zebra move they usually are much ahead of the wheel beast but you always find those ones that got left behind and so they move together with the wheel beast which is the case here these are a few male uh, bull uh, you know wheel beast as you can tell they have very thick horns and in, in between you can tell you know the, what we call the boss there it's quite thick meant for fighting and at the same time cushioning the skull from you know concussions yeah that is yeah zebra 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 this is the bachelors or the common zebra it's the only one we find here in the Masai Mara and these guys are doing very well they amount to around half a million during the migration this is one animal that is always giving birth every year interestingly they have been known to suckle you know two foals at the same time older spirit sibling and a younger one can continue suckling together and they're always carrying one at the same time they are you know they are suckling these two these three love the road look at them yeah I don't know if you're having a standoff because also I'm on the track I'm sure they're enjoying the track look at he's rubbing the nose <laughs> yeah there's always something to do with the bare ground is he gonna go down maybe yeah look at him very very healthy sometimes you can tell the health of a zebra by looking at the mane if it's falling down not in a straight line then it's not very healthy julia thank you for your comment it's a beautiful scene indeed it is one of a kind look at that you know this is what you get when you're here in the masai mara it's just a beautiful scenery you know endless rolling plains with a sea of grass and you know you can see as far as possible you know with uninterrupted you know views it's unbelievable now alia I showed you some three uh, lapwings, uh, like the one you're seeing there. And this is uh, the sperm winged lapwing. But I stopped here because she got some two chicks and I'm going to about a month. And I started following these two chicks when they were very, very tiny, but apparently they have grown so much. I cannot believe it. Very similar to adults. And I'm saying they're just slightly over a month old. And you can see how quickly they have grown. And I just stopped here to give a clap to this uh, female here for having done a very good job to have raised these chicks almost to maturity. So she got two, that's one of them. And uh, Kasti was directing the show today, has been following uh, the same chicks with me. And she also cannot believe how quickly they have grown. And that's the other one there. They'll always lay two to four eggs on the ground. And these lapwings are very territorial. And when you see the adult, I'm going to show you the mother. The mother is somewhere, and I'm assuming that's the mother. They usually got some clothes on their wings, apart from the normal clothes they have on the feet, we have like a spa on the wings, which they use to defend the territory and of course to fend off any would-be enemy that would come to either get their eggs or their chicks. That's the mother there. And they've got a hidden like spa, that's where they get that name, which they would use to fight even the jackals. Big raptors like martial eagles, you wouldn't believe how aggressive they get when they would feel the chicks or eggs are under threat of being predated on. I'm saying very well done. I'm very impressed by this particular female. The place they want, they normally prefer wetlands, habitats or marshes. And for about four days, I had been missing them until today. And I'm like, I have to look at the chicks. And both of them have been accounted for. 
he's always keeping a very close eye to them. And anything they can catch on the ground there, any invertebrates, any insects, that's what they'll be feeding on. Very well done, sparring lapwing, and hopefully we'll see these chicks to grow and become maybe better mothers or fathers like you. We're still in this location of these buffaloes again, and now we're watching those that were on the move. No, we didn't get to see this one because they were in the thicket. Now they're all going to come out, slowly coming out of the bush. We left these old male that were lying down there. And they probably, there's so many of them, so they would need water, water quite often. And it's got to be amount of water, not this little water hole. You know, such a buffalo herds like this. And every time they arrive in a small water hole, turn water to very much mud so finally they won't have enough of drink so they need a decent water hole but they also lack water they can also lie inside the water and they all dust bath i mean mud wallow in the water come out very dirty for protection against the flies and other other parasite such as a ticks So they are, they can move like almost like cows when you hear them. This is how they communicate. But in a herd, they happen sometimes they separate. Each group move on their own. And for them to able to catch up on one another, this is during the forage now, or meet again during uh, drinking time in the water hole. Well, they can drink quite a few days, few, few, few times a day, because grass is very dry. And yeah, we'll leave them, look for anything else. Still in this location, sorry about that. And what this buffalo are doing right now, it looks like they are probably looking to drink, as you can see how movement they're doing in there. So, but also during a day like this, that's where, you know, it's a lot safer because many of lions will be resting right now. It happens maybe lions behind them, wherever they come from, but they'll probably get hunted in the middle of the night if is that the case because lions of course you know they all follow behind the herd of buffalo and they're hoping for whoever's weaker and these limping buffalo sick buffalo cannot keep up with herd and those one they actually a main target for the pride of lion so but since they can help each other fight back lion and they do that when they face lions all get around and uh, look out, all of them, and they aim for a fight. Yes, Jumbo Jumbo, look what I just found. It is a beautiful, the long crested eagle. Yeah, the light is superb. You can see that beautiful bright, bright yellow eye, the carved, you know, bill or beak meant for tearing flesh and also killing. Yeah, it is one of the iconic, you know, eagles we have here in the Masai Mara, you know, identified by that long, beautiful crest. You know, he's hunting or she is hunting from that perch. They have this amazing binocular vision where they can pinpoint a mouse, a snake, a grasshopper, 
you know, small bird, you know, from that point, even up to around a kilometer away, and they can just swoop down and grab it. Also equipped with, you know, very, very strong, you know, talons, able for grasping, and, so, you know, sometimes they use the claws for killing, uh, you know, and the beak. Yeah, do you want to look this way so you can see your beautiful bill, beak, and, and uh, yeah, eye. Yeah, looks like this area is an area with lots of food because um, a little bit farther away you cannot see. There is another one, but it's a black chested snake eagle, so it seems like there is something that they like about this area. It's one of our rare eagles here, so it's always a pleasure to see one. And they say anywhere where you see these, uh, you know, super uh, predators, uh, raptors. Yeah, did you see that? Uh, how it, it's able to turn the head, you know, you know, backwards quite fast. I don't know what it thought. Maybe it thought another eagle was coming to chase it away. That hooked, you know, bill is for, you know, grabbing and killing and also tearing flesh. That's one thing that makes them, you know, true eagles. Look like he's stretching his neck slightly you know, up, it's like he's seeing something. Look how he's moving it very fast, like pinpointing something. I'm not sure, but looks like he's sussing out something. Where? I don't know. Look at that. They usually do that when they're pinpointing something. And then, yeah, and then you know, they'll fly from there at a very, very high speed, sometimes really low and then just catching their prey by surprise. It is a beautiful eagle. It's one of a kind, easy to identify by that long crest. You remember these guys? Tom, you ask me um, what is the biggest prey they can catch? For the long crested eagle, it can catch a scrub hare. That is what they can catch. Oh, it's taking off. Look at that. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a rather um, medium-sized eagle with beautiful white you know, spots on the wings. Yeah, he goes. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Beautiful, James. Thank you very much. Yeah, as I enjoy this a beautiful long crested eagle. I'll take you to uh, one of our other locations. Right, we're still in this location of this buffalo, but you know, as I was about to move out, I only realized, you know, I don't have a road right now, so I'd rather just wait a little bit to see if this, they have to cross before I can. So, and then it looks like they're gonna cross back north again. If it's that where they come from, the Beverly Souk property, that's where they're going right now. But they are lovely animals, all of looking good conditions. And the grasses, plenty of grasses. For them to survive, they don't have to have fresh grass always, but these dry grasses still sustain their lives and they just need to drink a lot of water. But the new shoot is already available on the ground here since we had that drizzling. And look at this one, she's probably looking at the rest of the herd. It's one of the cow here, the female. So hopefully we get our way out of here soon. Well, our water bugs are not moving away, but we got also in the sky, beautiful egrets flying there. These are cattle egrets. 
And these categories, I would expect them to be with those buffaloes there because they have some kind of a relationship. And the buffaloes move through the grass as they're feeding. They keep disturbing lots of insects and that's what they feed on. But they do not necessarily have to depend on the buffaloes uh, to feed or to survive. What they've done now, they have located maybe a new ground. And my guess is where they just landed, there could be some water there that has collected out of the rains that we have been having. And that's where they're going to catch any arthropods, frogs in that particular area. You can see the beauty of the Masimara. Initially here, we had two water bucks, two males that were fighting. And it's like, as soon as we got here, they one of them chickened out and they took off and they stopped the fight. When you look at all the antelopes, like over 70 species of antelopes we got in Africa, to me, the waterbucks are very magnificent, especially when you see them pose uh, like this male here. This is the, the first waterbuck, because you also got another species that is called the common waterbuck. It's rather windy, and you can tell from his body language, he's not very comfortable. And that's happened to many antelopes. Elands are coming in. Elands are the largest antelopes we've got in Africa. Huge, massive. But they're quite agile and very fast, regardless of their immense size. Normally very shy, I'm surprised. They're stopping there looking at us, and I'm happy to hear that you're saying they are very beautiful. Every time you stop, in general, they always tend to sneak away or move back away from people, away from cars. Rick, I have seen elands cross the river, but not like the zebras or the wildebeest. Once in a while, but it's very, very rare. I don't think it's more than five times, Rick, I've been out here uh, doing drives. I've seen them cross the river, but they do. And if they do, they'll not be in the water to drink, but very quickly, maybe come have a little drink and move, or they just come and cross and go. Because Rick, the, the elands, ideally, they, they both browse and graze at the same time. And most animals that tend to browse uh, will always get a lot of moisture from what they feed on. So they very rarely go for a drink. Just like giraffes, you know, sometimes they take so long before drinking. And it will be the same case with these huge uh, antelopes of Africa called the elands. You look at the fringe, uh, the fringe hair they got on their dewlaps. If you look at the one close to the camera, the dewlap is that muscle hanging under the neck. The males have bigger ones than females. And the same case would happen to the horns. And we believe the dewlaps will help them to thermoregulate when it gets too hot. Ox pickers enjoying the ride. And at the same time, feeding themselves. See how beautiful green that, that grass is. And we have always noticed, should they be, say, scared or spooked by predators like lions, you'll be surprised how fast they would run. And even from a position like where they are now, should they jump? We, we believe they jump pretty high, three, four meters high. Should they be scared by something like a snake or maybe should they see something like a mongoose and mistake it for something dangerous? Always walking in hearts. When the males get old, very old, you'll always hear them like they have knees that are knocking like metal. And that a sound always comes from the knees and from the village they come from because way back we didn't have any electricity. When we would walk as small boys, from one village to another, you could easily tell those are elands by listening to their click like sound from the knees of the old bulls. Elephant there on his own. I'm guessing that's another is a boy. 
bulls will always be on their own. He looks cool. He looks lonely, but he's fine, feeding. Very unusual uh, to see females on their own. Maybe he was just kicked out of the hut, not sure. And he's yet to get a group to hang out with. You see, when we get rains, now like the water you see there, it just collects after the rain, and we rarely see so many animals going uh, to the Mara River to drink. And I'm happy you're enjoying just to see that scenery, uh, Bungay, who is uh, managing the camera today that he's showing you. And in the background there, for those of you who are always with us every day, that is the very famous Olo Lolo escarpment. If you look carefully, you can see the trees and the open savanna, and that's what gave the Masai Mara its name. Masai, the locals here, and Mara translates to spots. Well, remember, we are coming to you live from different locations in Africa, and currently we are in the Masai Mara of Kenya. Very good. So saying earlier how you'd explain Masai Mara, because every conservation area, I mean, in Africa, and it's more so here in East Africa, was named, and the name comes from somewhere. So the Masai Mara, we have uh, so many tribes in Kenya, and one of the tribes are the Maasai, who live uh, in the periphery of this game reserve. But Mara, if you are up in the air in a hot air balloon or in a plane, when you look under, you'll always see these open uh, grasslands that we call the savanna. But of course, uh, they are covered by scattered trees here and there, some woodlands, and some little thicket of vegetation. And from up there, they look like spots. To the Maasai people, spots are Mara, M-A-R-A. -A. So the Maasai Mara, and it extends all the way at the drop of that escarpment is the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And Serengeti translates into endless plains from the local Maasai people here. Beautiful landscape. And when especially see once in a while an animal pass, bats flying, is always, uh, the, the scenery is always what watching well i'll move on hopefully i'll get some more lions that will be more active than once i saw earlier so you'll notice this elephant bull what it's doing is there's a looks like a old fallen down tree and it's just moved the tree away uh, or out of the way to get to some lush green grass underneath but what we wanted to do is just contrast the size of that tree in comparison to that elephant bull it's always amazing being able to watch elephants feeding and just to see how they actually use their trunk whenever they do feed now see, it, it looks like now after um, it had a bit of grass, it might have just broken off uh, one of the, what's known as a raisin bush. It's a particular uh, small-ish tree you do get in the area. Look at how he is pushing some of the leaves and also some of the smaller branches into its mouth. this elephant pushing over that tree just maneuvering the tusk on either side and what it might do it's probably trying to push it over to get it um, to the roots so 
Sabrina H8, so normally what we do is we are based in a particular area. So it depends on the range. I mean, different ranges and different reserves uh, might only spend a little bit of time there and then move towards the next reserve. But for us here at Ambiond, uh, what we do is we, um, we are based at a particular reserve, but we also will communicate with some of the other guides from the other reserves and then do swaps. Uh, so they'll come in and fill in our place as a ranger here and we'll fill in their place as a ranger there. And by doing so, we gain more experience about the different areas um, so that does occur where we do change but it's not that we rotate uh, necessarily between different reserves we might between different lodges but not necessarily the reserves unless we've organized that and it's and it's sometimes such a fun thing to do with uh, within the ranging team notice how this elephant is going to pull out the grass around that um, tree might just be uh, grabbing hold of it and using that trunk almost as a uh, as a, a counterweight just to break it off and then put it into its mouth. Good afternoon, guys. Welcome to a warm afternoon here in the Tuolu Kalahari. My name is Moritz as always and behind the camera we've got David and we are back here with these cheetah cubs. They are hiding a little bit so difficult to see them right now. We are going to zoom in for you shortly so that you can kind of see their, you know, their silhouette but we are going to give them some time. We just wanted to come and check in with them and see that they, whether mom has returned or anything like that. Um, so yeah, as you can see, like we've mentioned before, very good den sight. Um, and I'm actually not seeing any movement there at the moment. We saw their heads moving just now, but right in that spot, there you can see a little bit of movement in the shade. See there's a tail flicking and a head going and so on. Just over there, all three of the cubs still there doing well and being healthy. And we are actually quite hopeful that mom will join them this afternoon and see if they don't want to come out and, you know, nurse in the shade or something like that. But yeah, guys, what we are going to do with mom being gone, we might actually try and follow up on her tracks a little bit and see if we can't find her while it's still hot and have a look at what she's doing. Well, my tracking for the dogs has gone very well. I had another flat tire. <laughs> Theo and I have just changed a tire. I don't know why I keep getting flat tires. Poor Wendy or poor Lauren, I'm not sure. Anyway, we just thought we'd come to the dam and we're rather hot and sticky and relax and enjoy the hippos. The dogs are here, we're going to find them and they will come to the dam to hunt. I am absolutely sure of it. Once that sun starts to get a little bit lower and it gets a little bit cooler for everyone, including the dogs, they're going to come here. They're going to be thirsty and normally there's plenty of food around. There's some Inyala at the other side. I don't see the water buck today, but there's definitely plenty of food around. There's some kudus around too. So I'm more than sure they're going to hunt. And now our hippos have disappeared on us. Why, hippos? Why? Damien, good question. Now, hippos are mammals. So the fact that they're mammals means... Oh, look at this bird. I think it's the... Heron, it's fishing, sorry Theo. The fact that they're mammals means that they're warm-blooded. All mammals are warm-blooded and hippos, although they spend most of their time in the water, they are essentially terrestrial. Although they're called hippopotamus amphibious, which means they live a sort of two-phase lifestyle, half in the water, half on land, just like an amphibian. So that's what kind of strikes people as a little bit confusing sometimes. But they are warm-blooded and they are a mammal. I think we have the green-backed hair in here, but let me get my binos out. Oh, what's it catching? Look how well it's just hanging onto this branch here. Incredible. Or is it the bittern? Sometimes you can get confused between the two, but the bitterns normally have red eyes. 
And from what I can see, this one has yellow eyes. It's eating something. I'm really, really, really not sure what it's eating, but I'm pretty sure it's a green backed heron. You can tell immediately from that long, straight beak what it eats. Insects, frogs, fish. Even some small, small reptiles. But I think this one's taking insects. I'm not sure. It's definitely not fishing for fish here. But I think it could just be taking insects off the surface of the water. Wow. Cheetah Chan, you're saying, could it be tadpoles that they're catching? Good theory, but I don't think so. It's not quite the time for tadpoles just yet, but it will be soon. And normally the tadpoles sort of emerge in smaller water bodies where the it's very, very shallow. Now, Chitwa Dam is huge and where this greenback heron is currently fishing for something, it's quite deep and it's in the middle of the dam. So I don't think it will be tadpoles, but I could be wrong. The frogs will start emerging soon. The hat tadpoles will start appearing soon. I really can't see what it's fishing for. It's not deep. The beak's hardly dipping into the water, so I just think it must be some sort of aquatic insect. Look how well, how well it's clinging onto this branch. KB, you're asking, do they jab their prey with the beaks? I hope I got that question right. Oh, I did. Stab, maybe not jab. Similar thing. Um, not essentially. So the greenback heron, they obviously have such a broad diet, but they will use their beak to sort of fish in the water and snatch it out. And that's why it's so long. They don't have the long water legs of some birds. And in this particular part of the dam, it's actually very deep. So it's not as if they can stand. So the way that this bird is perched is absolutely perfect. The beak can go right into the water and grab the prey. Then they'll shake it. If it's a frog or if it's a small reptile, they'll keep shaking it and shaking it until they sadly crush it and it dies before they swallow. But they don't really use that beak to stab. Some birds do, but I don't believe the green-backed heron does. But they're very, very patient birds. I haven't seen one in quite a while. But I'm sure if, it, if the prey is larger, if it's a larger frog or a larger fish, then that beak could act as a stabbing weapon. It's sharp enough, it's long enough. But I'm sure for smaller animals, it'll just be used to fish. But for larger prey, I'm guessing they actually could stab. Wow, it's so lovely to just sit and admire the dam and not be changing a tire. <laughs> wow. You see those reflexes? Precision. Using his eyesight. Not missing a beat. Kirsten, I didn't get that. Sorry, one more time. Oh, everyone's enjoying this. Isn't it lovely? That is a very sharp beak. Yes, I can definitely stop. I think it's having a little bit of a drink as well in between catching. I just wish I could see what it was that it's catching. If anybody's able to figure it out, you're welcome to send us your suggestions. Or maybe it's just admiring its reflection. <laughs> so we'll sit at the dam a few minutes longer and then we really are going to find those dogs. Is it
with me today is Odie, as usual, and we are here at Pridelands Conservancy, which is part of Baluli. Why not show you some plants? But it's actually something that we have camp that is why it's in a tin, stolen it um, from camp. Now, Odie's shouted at me if I place it on the... Um, uh, so apologies for the the um, break there. I don't know why. Let me see if I do that. Okay, cool. I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this down over here so I don't move it because I'm a bit on the shaky side. But this plant is quite a cool plant. It's called a speck worm or pork bush, um, as well. I suppose the direct translation is. But um, if you look at it, it's got these little succulent leaves on them. Now, this plant doesn't actually occur up in this biome, in the savanna biome. This is from the thicket biome all the way down in the eastern cape of South Africa, or at least the southeast coast of South Africa. But it is a very important uh, It's a very important plant species um, that we have. And it, you can see it's actually flowering at the moment, which is something that you don't get to see. So the reason why it is so important, and I know I've touched on this briefly, is because it is very effective at turning or converting carbon dioxide into oxygen which is awesome and it doesn't just do it during the day it does it at night time as well it's able to store solar energy in the leaves but there's so many more things other than just being a plant that uh, helps provide us with lots of oxygen it is oh i've eaten so many leaves already it is also very tasty Ooh. So nice. It's a little bit on the tart side. It's a, a bit sour, but at certain times of the day, especially in the uh, early mornings or later evenings, it tastes much better. It's not as sour, but middle of the day like this, not great. Um, so you can eat it. The other thing that you can do is you can chew the leaves in your mouth, and if you've got any ulcers or anything like that, it will help soothe it. So it tastes much better than aloes. If you've ever eaten an aloe before, don't. Wouldn't recommend it. Very bitter. You pull crazy faces. Um, and then the other thing that you can also do is if you've got any open wounds or mos mosquito bites, insect bites, you can crush the leaves up and the juices from those leaves are really good antiseptic and will also help soothe the itch. There's a dragonfly on... I was just pointing out a dragonfly to Theo there, but it's off again. I'm determined to get a dragonfly, the first one of this season, but it's flown away, I'm afraid. So we're just admiring the hippos, enjoying the breeze. Summer's really coming, I'm getting excited. But despite all the things that go wrong when you're driving through nature, like flat tires and sometimes issues with signal, it's so wonderful that we can bring this all to you live. It's all happening right in front of your eyes from six different locations across Africa. Isn't that quite incredible? And it happens every day, twice a day. Sometimes we see nothing and we bumble and we mumble, but then sometimes we see everything. So as I mentioned, we are going to look for the dogs. They just seem to have moved from their original location this morning because of the heat. So it's just going to take a little bit of time to try and relocate them again because they're going to be tucked away flat as pancakes in the shade. It's not flat cat this time, it's flat dogs. But that is our plan. We've loved answering all your questions and your comments. Keep sending them through, please do. Theo and I are now going to really begin our search for those endangered African wild dogs. A very good afternoon, our dear viewers. My name is Fred, and you're catching us live from the Moara Triangle. It's been pretty a quiet afternoon, so we're very lucky we've come to this uh, particular section of the Moara Triangle, not far away from the Moara River, and uh, we've got an interesting collection of animals. Right here in front of us is a family of elephants, uh, peacefully grazing in this wet wetland. And uh, it's quite uh, very 
very interesting that in this small family of elephants, there are so many uh, youngsters uh, of different ages. And uh, oh, it's a hyena. It's, it's a bit to the left side in front of the elephants. Uh, this whole the hyena probably sleeping in the grass. And uh, I think the elephants got close to him and just decided to give way. Uh, to our right, we got uh, another member of the big five, a small herd of buffaloes. All of them look like the old bulls. Uh, probably these are the retired generals who are most likely too old to keep up with the main herds. So this is quite uh, so exciting to have a two of the big five right in front of us. In a distance, further behind the L. Uh, come up with your question again, please. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, the elephants are quite very big and bulky animals. And uh, for the better part of the day, and even during the night, you'll always see them feeding. And uh, this is because, you know, it's, it quite demands a lot of fuel to power such a huge body. So on average, a mature elephant can eat up to 200 kilograms of grass. Uh, Archie, we can uh, zoom your camera a bit behind the elephants. You see we've got an array of so many other playing games. We've got water bugs, we've got zebras, uh, a herd of impalas together with uh, topis. So this is a typical way of these prey animals coming together. You see they've got different, uh, they've got noses and uh, eyes positioned at different uh, angles or levels. So when they come together, this is kind of going to improve or ensure top-notch uh, enemy surveillance. And we've got a hyena not far away from, that, uh, from them, though he seems not interested and is not paying a lot of attention uh, on the uh, gasols and the antelopes. Uh, in the Mora Triangle at the moment, uh, elephants seems to be uh, uh, the animals that are doing really, really very well. And uh, as you drive around this part of the triangle, you'll always see herds of elephants uh, spreading in the grassland. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, these animals are happy staying here and we'll be happy to drive on and look for other things as well. Right. So guys, the springbok got a little shy just as we were about to come over here. They all took off into the bush. It was quite the beautiful group and there was a couple of little ones with them as well. There is, however, a blue wildebeest walking just behind or in in front of us over there. Big territorial bull. And I remember we spoke about them the other morning. So this guy has actually got a prime territory at the moment. Um, there's a water hole just off to our left. Some good grazing, especially during summertime around here, or well, more browsing, but for the blue wildebeest it would be grazing. So he's going to see a lot of the ladies especially when they come into the water it might, might not be a long visit but it's just enough time for him when they move through his territory to see what's up with all the females possibly mate with one or two of them if they're in estrus as you can see guys just from you know over here to all the way in the Maasai Mara, the big differences in behavior between the animals where the males become territorial over here and up there you find them migrating.
Very, very cool. But yeah, big, beautiful boy, absolutely in his prime. And he has to be, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of other male blue wildebeest that's going to want this particular territory. So he's going to get competition quite often. All the young boys that's decided, no, we are strong enough now to start having territories of our own. They're going to... So Marco just had a question, are they able to protect their territories from predators? Now Marco, when it comes to territories, it's it's not about predators or prey or so. Territories are up or established specifically for, for breeding purposes. Breeding and then food purposes. So um, for females, like let's say for instance, if we think about lions, they form a pride and they have a territory and the size of their territory is determined about the availability of prey and then water and then obviously also den sites, places where they can hide their cubs. However, you don't get competition between different species for different territories. Um, you will get competition for food between different species and all of those types of things. But when it comes to territories, it's mainly because of breeding and, you know, raising offspring. So that is more interspecific competition. So within each species that they compete with one another. Um, so no, he won't be able to defend himself within, it, within his territory against predators that is completely up to how fast he is and so on but it's absolutely not a territorial thing it's good it's because he needs to be fast enough to outrun the let's say the cheetah that wants to eat him or strong enough to overpower him or something like that so when it comes to territories nothing to do with predator prey relationships and more about mating rights and you know raising offspring at the end of the day so absolutely interspecific competition so yeah, to come back to him, he's going to have a lot of competition from young boys within his species, you know, the blue wildebeests, um, that wants to take over this particular area because it's a prime area for females to come through and for mating rights and all of those things. So really a good place to have that territory. A lot of his genes will most likely get passed on as well. Uh, just because of that, because the ladies come through here a lot of the time, or quite often. Interesting, wildebeest territory, and it, it's, it's important things. Animals, they have a signal, signal of communication things. So we, this afternoon, decided to come further east from Cheetah Cut Line. Yeah, Cheetah Cut Line. And there was a report of the lion this morning far inside Beverly Sook. And when we saw the buffalo, then reminded me of maybe later they're gonna go hunt, probably. But nobody have visited where they were last seen and we're gonna get update from these guys that are heading in that area to relocate them so we will spend time looking around looking around here hoping for them to come out for us We have the most stunning tawny eagle in the middle of Chitwa Dam. The coloration is absolutely incredible. Look at that wide, long yellow gape. You see that? Immediately, you know it's a tawny eagle when you get to see it this close. And they do have different color morphs. They have a very, very dark color morph where it's all sort of chestnut, deep brown. Then they have a really pale one where they're almost all white. This is an in-between one. The coloration is just stunning. You can hear the starlings and the lapwings and the geese. Yes, everyone, I agree. Beautiful. 
It was on the ground when we first approached. Sorry about that. Right next to the buffalo weaver nest, on that island in the middle of Chitwa. Gorgeous. I wonder what he was doing on the ground though. Tony eagles are quite adaptable and although they do normally hunt small mammals and other birds, reptiles, frogs, fish, you will see them feeding on insects if they really have to. Opportunistic. And when summer comes and you see the alates, the termite alates streaming out, those reproductive termites with their wings streaming out of holes, it makes everything look like you're in a fairy tale. The tawny eagles will absolutely utilize that, stand above the holes and try to snatch up as many alates as they can. And because termites work 24 hours a day, they're actually packed with a lot of fats and proteins. So they make a really good delicacy for so many animals out here from your raptors like this tawny eagle to leopards hyenas and even humans you can fry them I have no idea what they taste like but in terms of nutrition they're actually extremely nutritious termites never stop they work all day and that's why they're packed with nutrition and that's why lots of animals love to eat them JP, you're asking how many different eagles do we get in Juma? Let's go through the most common ones that we do get. I've never seen the step eagle here, but apparently around the sort of northern sector of the Sabi Sands, it has been sighted. We regularly see the tawny eagle. It's an all year round resident. We see the lesser spotted eagle and we see the African hawk eagle. The Wahlberg's eagle, it's a migrant, but that does come on through. The Marshall Eagle, I have to say, that's my second favorite after the Tony. I love a Marshall Eagle. And not so long ago, Davi and I found a long crested eagle. They're not too common in this area, but we found one here on Chitwa Chitwa. And I've never seen the African crowned eagle here. I don't think the distribution extends as far into the low veld. So there's a huge range of eagles that you can get here and lots of birds that are all really, really closely related to the eagles as well. The Feroz eagle is one I really, really want to see. It's a fierce looking bird. It's black, all the feathers are black with a striking yellow beak, very similar to this tawny. And they have a really sort of large distribution across Africa. I imagine they probably can get found in this area too, but I've never seen one. And it's definitely on my bucket list. They have a slightly different habitat. They prefer sort of mountainous, rocky areas. So I'm not sure Juma would make that requirement. Catherine K, you're asking, are tawny eagles the same as booted eagles? And the answer is no. I will, I'm not able to show you my app, I'm afraid, but the booted eagle is different. It looks slightly similar. I can see why you ask that in terms of color, but normally they have a red eye. And if you just focus on this tawny, if we can get a bit closer, you see how the beak is yellow and the gape of the beak extends really far back, almost to the back of the eye. The booted eagle, it doesn't extend that far back. It will normally stop right before the eye. I hope that makes sense. And they obviously have feathers going down their legs as well. Now I'm just going to check if you just give me two seconds for a size comparison. I don't actually know the difference in the size, but let's find out together. Okay. A booted eagle can go to 50 centimeters tall. A tawny eagle goes to 71 centimeters tall. So yes, the tawny is slightly taller and it's also slightly heavier. So it's a bigger eagle. But great question, they are separate species, but very similar. Raptors are hard, especially in flight. You've really got to sort of watch them, get a closer look, pick out key features before you can really identify what it is you're looking at. We've got some monkeys over here. Some vervet monkeys, I wondered what you were up to. You see just this termite mound over here, Theo? They're running about, probably causing trouble. There's one just to the right of this tree. 
Yep, there you go. Oh, that one was missing parts of its tail. I don't know if you saw that. It's got a short tail. Ah, the monkeys are exploring Chitwa. Christian's asking if it's possibly injured. It, does, it did look like it was limping when it was running. Just this one on the right, Theo. But it's walking completely fine now. Oh, no, wait. I'm looking through my monitor here. It's very possible that there's an injury. Look at it standing like a meerkat. <laughs> Monkeys don't like to be on the ground for too long. They prefer to be up a tree. It's dangerous here. There's dogs. There's leopards, there's lions. There's all sorts of predators that can get them on the ground. Look at them go. <laughs> they can run remarkably fast. They were waiting for us this morning. They were waiting for Theo and I. The minute we step out the car, they jump in the car. They're hoping to find any sort of delight. They've stolen my Tiger Balm, my Vaseline, my gloves any sort of lip balm I may, may have, my sun cream. Yes, they love raiding the vehicle, which is rather unfortunate. Okay, we're gonna bumble around and hopefully spot our African wild dogs. It is rather unfortunate. I once remember the vivid monkey stealing blankets off my game drive vehicle when I did a boat cruise with guests. Not fun at all. But anyways, in case you haven't had anything to eat, lunch is served. Just joking. Right. I'm now going to be yielding a dangerous weapon. Children, please don't play with knives. It's not a really good idea. Adults, also be careful. I guess I probably should tell you what this is hey so this <laughs> is called a jelly melon it's actually got lots of different names or a horned melon and um it's part of the cucumis genus um yeah i've never tried one of these before but a really good friend of mine told me about them and then when i was on a walk in the bustling metropolis of hutzbreit that is literally just a few hundred meters away from me um he said that i well we found one and he's like well you've got to wait for it to be Right, so I've been waiting, I kid you not, three weeks for this thing to be orange because that's when I've seen the birds eating it. Now, it's, it's supposedly edible. Uh, they say that if you do taste any bitter, uh, bitter parts, spit it out. Don't eat the bitter parts because that would mean that it's a little bit poisonous. But there's no way to really differentiate between the poisonous parts and the savory parts. So we shall be testing this theory out today. I'm going to... Oh, the in order audio break up there i think um i'm gonna make it easier for you i'm gonna put it here i'm also going to try and turn my very dangerous sharp knife i definitely should not uh, use this so what you can do with this um i have to cut it this way sorry because of my ocd i don't want to cut it from the stalk i've got to do it this way and i'm right hand right handed and uh, so you can slice this up and pickle it and it's quite nice but what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to cut into it and i'm going to reveal what it looks like we have got to do some placing here here we go isn't that nice how's my plating michelin star chef over here let me tell you look at that so it kind of looks like a cucumber right with all those seeds i should have asked owen to bring me a spoon <laughs> that's exactly what i did because he ran into camp to quickly grab me a plate because i thought this is going to be a messy affair and i don't like sticky things all over the car because that brings ants and no one likes ants so what you're supposed to do is scoop out the inside here and then eat it sorry i'm turning it away from you again i'm going to try and cut it again oh prickly be careful put that over there and now i'm going to taste it but uh, i'm probably gonna have to why are a lot of you saying no thank you? What are you talking about? This is grown by many people all over Africa, even in Asia and Australia and, and all those wonderful places. And it is eaten by lots of different people all the time. So why not? It smells nice. It smells a little bit like a kiwi and a banana. That's quite cool. That's oh, <laughs> It's so bitter. I'm not going to eat it. No, no. I don't know. I'm going to try some more. That whole thing. I don't know if I should have left it for longer. 
No, they say you mustn't eat it if it's bitter, but you, if it's not, I don't know if this is ripe then. Hang on, I'm going to get some of the, the seeds and things out. So yeah, so like I was saying, a lot of people do like to grow this. The animals absolutely love to feast on it. The birds, the monkeys, I'd imagine kudu. Holistic, no, it's actually nothing like a prickly pear at all. That is delicious. Um, that is a, that's smaller. If I had to describe a prickly pear, it's more like the size of a kiwi with a, the same sort of texture. So not, not the texture of the kiwi, not that sort of velvety weird smell. I apologize for my weird position. I'm just leaning on the steering wheel. I can't eat it because it's better than it says it's rust and eat it if it's better. I don't think I've left it for long enough. But anyways, um, so a prickly pear has got these tiny, tiny, tiny little hairs on the outside. They're actually a bit of a nightmare. Almost like we would call them in South Africa paper thorns. And um, if you get them in your hand, so pretty much when you touch them, they go all in your hands and it takes ages. And I have a very funny story about a guest that once fell into a prickly pear thicket while she was using the luxury facilities. Not a fun time. Not for her, not for me. Um, so, so yeah, so different, but prickly pears are really tasty, really delicious. This is supposed to, I think, taste like a combination of a watered-down kiwi and banana. That's what I've read. It smells exactly like that description. However, this one tastes absolutely nothing like it. It tastes like I've eaten a bitter aloe. Not very nice. So I probably won't be putting that in my mouth. But I haven't seen it growing around here. So I don't know if a bird or something fed on it in the in the distance and maybe dropped and defecated somewhere in the wildlife or threat wildlife estate. But that's where I found it growing. So literally across the road. It's not far at all. It's not to say that it doesn't occur here. Um so this the common name for it is a horned melon or a jelly melon. I can give you the Latin name, I just can't remember it. So I have it I have a thingy with it on. On memento. Cucumus met I can't, the species names of some of these plants are ridiculous. Metuliferous, something like that. Metuliferous, cucumis metuliferous. Apologies, cannot Latin for anything, not even the dance. So, yeah, I can't pronounce it either, as you can imagine. But anyway, it's quite interesting, though. So, yeah, so when I actually found them, it was quite hard to find one because they'd all been devoured already by a variety of different things. So I was lucky, but I'm really, really disappointed that it didn't taste as delicious as was stated in the books and on the interweb. All right, so Jenny is sitting around hoping for a, a probably that, you know, Talambo which is no sign of her the last time um, they have visited the area where she was last seen this morning and it seems to be no tracks of leading anyway. Here we stopped right now with beautiful plain zebra. As you can see how they position uh, themselves. So Shutterbark want to know why do their mane on a zebra stand up on their neck? That's a very good question that, you know, a lot of time we don't talk about what the mane means on this animal. But, you know, I always try to share this kind of information. So the mane is very important. So it, it means animals healthy. So zebra, it's kind of hard an animal to tell whether they're sick or they're not sick. They don't mainly lose condition quite quickly. But the minute you see that mane, you know, fall sideways, it's not rise up, and then you know that animal, it's sick. I'm not entirely sure if it's the same with horses, which, are, well, it's different mane, what I think. But many zebras, these species, could be a mountain zebra, could be a, um, uh, the other species where you found up in the rock sections, the main, it's, it, it actually indicate, can tell you if the animal's sick or not by looking at that main. But look like this one, all of them there, we're looking at them right now. They're all healthy.
Welcome to and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. As you can see, we have two black rhino off in the distance there. They are just being a little bit cautious as you can, I don't know if you can hear, but it's a quite a windy day here at and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve and it has made them a little bit weary and the rhinos don't tend to have such great eyesight they rely very heavily on their sense of sight oh sorry their sense of smell and their sense of hearing and with this wind that's disrupted that a little bit so it has put them a little bit on alert and i think also our approach has made them aware that there is something around here and they're just not quite sure at what it is so my name is kim <laughs> My name is Kim and behind the camera we have Craig and we will be with you at and beyond Pinna for the afternoon. It is wonderful to see rhino. It is becoming a more rare and rare sight, especially these black rhino. There's only about, it's actually closer to 5,000 left in the world. So they are quite highly endangered. Luckily, Due to many different projects, such as uh, the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project, their numbers are actually increasing. So that's a, a good sign for the, uh, I suppose, for the sustainability of the of the species, especially for the genetics of the species by opening up the the areas that they occupy, we can broaden their genetic diversity. Francis, that is an, a good question. Now, as you can see, both of them have been dehorned, and there is a certain disadvantage to dehorning rhino, and that is when they defend their territories, they often use that horn to fight over the territory, so it will disadvantage them slightly. Now, how we've rectified that situation here is we make sure that all our rhino are dehorned, so one does not have an advantage over the other. There is also some, you know, use of the horn to protect themselves against predators. But at and beyond Pinda, we uh, we don't have we have quite a lot of general game, and so our lions don't tend to go for for rhino. I think we've lost two rhino in the entire existence of the reserve and it's just because there's a lot easier prey that is available to them so they don't tend to hunt these these rhinos so these rhino aren't really at risk of predators they are slowly walking off into the distance you can actually see amazing how they were so clear a moment ago and now just as they go off into the brush and you know, they start to disappear just like those elephants you were seeing earlier today and Nikki was saying how you can get surprised by an elephant. It's exactly the same as these black rhino. In fact, when you're walking through thickets like this, you can see the terrain in front. It's low shrubs with, you know, little bits of open grassland in between. And that is ideal sort of uh, terrain for a, for a black rhino. They, they don't feed on grass, such as the white rhino do. They actually feed on little twigs and you can often find these little broken off bits of twig that where black rhino have been feeding and it's a sign that they are in, in their area. When you come across areas such as this, this is exactly the kind of terrain that they prefer. Also now going off into the thicker bush, it's going to block a little bit of this wind and it's going to enable them to, to smell a lot better and hear a lot better, which is also going to to make them feel a little bit more comfortable the fact that their their senses are a little bit more restored because those bushes are going to be blocking that wind now it's quite interesting from this distance
Bassus just asked us if, if Pinder has a, a, a monitoring program for the rhinos, and yes, we do. So we've got a number of vehicles that go out every day, and they try and track our rhinos just to keep a good idea of their movements, what their behavior is like, what their health conditions like, and to make sure that we still, you know, we keep count of all our rhino. We, we even have a team spe specifically for our black rhinos, and they they go out every day tracking them we've also started looking at certain trackers that we put in the ear or on the foot we are testing different type of collars and tracking devices and that's just to see you know how they work out in the field if it perhaps irritates the rhino you, you know you don't want to put a, a tracking device on a rhino that's then going to um, get a bit of dirt or grit in it and then that can actually wear away at the foot or the skin and can cause infection which we don't want. So we're busy experimenting with a variety of tracking devices and the theory is that hopefully we're going to get a small tracking device preferably in the air and we'll be able to set up, send up a drone and that will just log the uh, the positions of the rhino and that way we can keep an accurate count and know that none of our rhino have gone missing so we don't have to worry that any have been poached. You know, we're very lucky with the dehorning that we've been doing. We've actually had very, very limited poaching at at uh, and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve, and it's such a treat to actually be able to sit and watch rhino and not worry about you know whether they're going to be poached, if they're going to be here tomorrow. We can just sit and enjoy them. And this is actually a very rare site. As I said, you know, they're quite endangered. So what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit further, see if we can get, keep, keep with them for a little bit and see if we can watch what they get up to. Yes, it's always nice to see rhinos in their own natural habitat. Yeah, what a gift to have in a place like that where they're really, really protected. Okay, over here I have found two lionesses. Very fast asleep. Looks there's a bit of eye twitching. No other sign of life here. But definitely they are alive, you can tell. They're very, very clean, enjoying the evening sun. It is normal for them um, after hiding the whole day, maybe in the bushes to come out and just warm up. Also, they have a very good area where they are. They have a good vantage point where they can look down to see what they're going to have uh, later. This is one of two of the Mugoro Pride male females. They've wandered quite a long way from where I normally see them and not far from uh, where they've been hiding in the long grass. There's nothing much around apart from big buffalo, which I don't think they're able to bring down by themselves. So, Leanne, you ask why lions have got so much hair uh, in around the ears. I think is to prevent insects from flying in and also dust from clogging the ear. As you can see, you know, it's protected all around, so nothing goes inside. That is a very big female. Very healthy. Look at that coat. Uh, yeah, really, really healthy. I love that whiskers. I don't know if anybody can volunteer to count them. How many are they? Can we try to do that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how many you've got, but I think I got 11. I don't know how many you got. If you got 11, just, you know, clap for yourself. But she is really looking good. She's in very good shape and very fast asleep, as you can see. She's allowed. Lions are, you know, known to be opportunists. So why lying like this? They could pounce at something at a very fast speed. They can go to from 0 to 60 in over less or less than, you know, 6 seconds. So they're very, very fast. 
they have you know very fast reflex reflexes so you know don't uh, dare anybody to go and say to give them a tummy rub next time you're somewhere where they are it's dangerous you know lion lion population in the mara is very very healthy is very very healthy although on the periphery on the borders they are threatened by habitat loss and human wildlife conflict i'm going to leave these girls to continue with your sleep and try and find something else that is active so we've been lucky enough to get another view of these two black rhino uh, which is actually when i say lucky because black rhino tend to be a little bit more skittish than white rhino you know white rhino they'll be pretty relaxed around vehicles but black rhino often are quite nervous and tend to run when they hear you but we're lucky that these ones are actually giving us quite a show here and the one that just moved into its profile view is actually the perfect way to describe to you how I know this is a black rhino. I'm sure most of our viewers have, have heard this before, but I think this is a good opportunity for those who haven't to just look at the, the key identifying features. Now the first one most of most people will tell you is that saddle back. Now that's really prominent. You can see how there's a quite a hump behind the neck, large neck muscle there. Then it goes predominantly down almost as if you're going to put a horse saddle on the back and then it goes up again at the rear. It's different to white rhino. White rhino's backs are pretty level with three smaller humps making sort of a W. Now the second one is the head, the position of the head. And this to me is the first thing that always becomes apparent when I'm looking at a, a black rhino. Its head is very high set on its body, almost as if it's looking up at you over the bush. Now you will never see a white rhino doing that. They've got incredibly strong neck muscles and they actually prevent the head from going looking up so high. So they can only lift their head to a certain point. So the second something looks like it's looking up at you over a bush, you know it's a black rhino. And the third, its head is just behind the bush. So it's difficult to, to show, but it does have a pointed lip not a square lip as the the white rhino does and the reason for this is because as i said before they do actually feed on branches and twigs so it gives them much easier access to the branch or the twig whereas the square jaw of the white rhino uh, will you know give them a much easier access to the grass so fun fact they did actually once try and genetically combine the black rhino and the white rhino just to see if it was feasible for them to maybe create a new species um, to try and preserve the black rhino you know they don't mate naturally they are two different species so we, they tried to do that once and it did have quite disastrous results there was a small calf and i can't remember if it had a square lip or a pointed lip but it was the opposite of what it ate. So it either had a square lip and ate branches or it had a pointed lip and ate grass. And it didn't end up surviving for too long. So it was a failed experiment, uh, but a good one to try out. In fact, you can actually see, if you look on the left, now you can see that pointed. So Snow Leopard has just pointed out that very large wound on the side of the black rhino and it is a common um, thing that you do find on black rhinos especially around the front the front legs just just by the armpits uh, these are skin lesions caused by a parasite um, and what happens is when these rhino visit communal dung middens the the flies actually lay their larvae in the dung midden and then these things called filariform worms then work their way into the skin of the black rhino and infect it causing those wounds it's quite interesting that it only affects black rhino it does not you will not see this on a white rhino which is very interesting because their skin you know is about the same thickness and very similar so i'm not too sure why it will only affect the black rhino 
does look quite painful. Sometimes if you see, now the reason I say it's from the filariform worm is because it's so high up on the side. If you saw maybe a wound below the belly of the rhino and she had a calf, that could be, uh, that could actually be as a result of the calf suckling. They do tend to have quite sh sharp horns and they are weaned a lot later in life. So sometimes towards the end, before they, just before they weaned, they also tend to cause a little few wounds on the mother's belly. In fact, if we look at the size difference between these two, black rhino if you look at the size difference between the rhino there's not a huge difference so I think it is the towards the end of um, of the young rhinos uh, sorry <laughs> the young rhinos life oh not young rhinos life <laughs> So Animal Life has asked us a question about the distribution of the rhinos. Now, they were once found through sub-Saharan Africa, um, and with the exception pretty much of the Congo, but now it's, it's much limited, it's much more limited through Southern Africa. You, we've got a, a bit of distribution in Kenya, we've got some in Botswana, we've got some in South Africa, and Namibia as well and that's pretty much where you're going to find black rhino so it's it has greatly decreased over the years but again we are hoping to increase that distribution with projects such as black rhino range expansion projects sorry let me just clarify my thought earlier it's not towards the end of the rhino's life it's towards the end of the the time it's going to be spending with its mother you know, anywhere between two and four years, the mother is actually going to drive out the calf so she can then have a new calf and put all her energy into raising that one. We're going to stay with these rhino and see what they do. I'm hoping that they maybe come a little bit closer and we can get a bit of a, a better view. Yes, look what else we found. One of the most beautiful eagles we see we find here in the Masai Mara, the African fish eagle. The reason she is there, I'll call her she, it's because there's plenty of water. And I think using her eyesight, she spotted something swimming and came landed there. It could be um, basically mostly it is fish, could be catfish or mudfish. They have amazing eyesight that can penetrate through clear water and sometimes can see fish swimming almost on the surface. Look at that. This is a fully grown, you know, female and she's quite serious. The reason she's not, yeah, the reason she's there, there is something. Look at that. Uh, she, she's gonna go for something maybe let's let's wait and see this is very exciting i hope you know you're enjoying this this fish sorry this fish eagle is found you know here in east and central africa all the way to southern africa sometimes you find it far inland because it also can feel on feed on smaller reptiles but it's a quite big eagle. I'm hoping that it can spot something and then show us exactly why it came to land there. Yes, uh, you know, looks every time it's getting excited, might go for something. Yes, it does look like an American bald eagle. It's our, our version of the American you know, bald eagle. I would say this is slightly smaller of the bald eagle. Uh, but it's very much, you know, everything, you know, from the big, the sea, which is the yellow, you know, color, the, you know, white uh, breast and head, all that, it's very much like an American bald eagle. It's getting twitchy and you could tell that it was getting excited. It might be waiting for that perfect moment so that it can dive down into that water 
and grab whatever is there. But for sure, you don't see them patched on the ground for nothing. It means they saw something, maybe they lost it, or whatever they were looking for, so detected them, and so it stood still in the mud, and so they cannot see it anymore. Right from where it is to where I am, it's quite a distance, but I'm sure it can see my lips moving and talking, you know, though it doesn't know I'm talking about it. Look at how it, you know, turns the head so it can, can have a, you know, a better, better look. Definitely there is something it's looking for. Yeah, every now and then you can see it's moving its... There we go. Did you get it? Did you get it? Got something, yes. You can see that it got something. Yes, I was right. Yes, it got something. That was really fast. Now it's a matter of where it's going to land, so we see what it has taken. Now it's going farther and farther away, and it's been followed by that uh, lapwing. So it could have taken a young lapwing. That's why the lapwing is trying to mob it and chase it. That was amazing. I hope you know you enjoyed that. Was that was super cool? Yeah, that was super cool. Yes, you really get to see that. Oh, here is Magdalene and her, uh, you know, little gislings, gooselings, and they're enjoying a bit of vegetables. These guys are just about one month. Remember, uh, last month we saw them, they were really, really small, but they grow very, very fast. They were 10 and now they're eight. They're really enjoying the grass. To the left there, do you see the left there? Look at the left there, you see a small crocodile? James, do you see it? Left, left. Yeah, there at the corner there. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see the small crocodile. It's the tiniest one we've seen. Yeah, I'm gonna stick to this location and enjoy my crocodile for a little bit more. Alrighty guys, we've got some three really cool birds over here. These are called Birchall's sand grouse. The one with the gray face is the male and the female is a little less colorful in the face. And this is one of three different species of sand grouse that we have around here. So we get the Birchall sand grouse, we get the Namaqua sand grouse, and then the double banded sand grouse. And these guys are typically confined to like the red Kalahari sandy areas. So, almost exclusively indigenous to not Tsualu, but to the Kalahari. I mean, obviously, guys, remember they've got wings, so you can't tell them where they're supposed to be. They can fly wherever they want to. But you will find them in pairs or in, you know, small groups, three to five, maybe ten, all together foraging. Um, however, they, they mate, they, they form a monogamous pair, so... Um, they do mate for life, and they nest solitary. Oh, I'm so happy that you guys are adding these birds to your lists, especially if it's a new one. Um, I have to say, when I started working in the Kalahari, the, the first time I saw them, that was also great excitement for me, um, to add another one to your personal list. Still beautiful to see now, even. But yeah, guys, like I said, monogamous. However, you will find them in groups when they are mating and when they nest, they, they, they're ground nesters. So you'll find them having a small scrape in the ground with two to three eggs in it, um, just lined with a little bit of foliage underneath just to, you know, insulate it a little bit against the warm Kalahari soil or cold ones during the winter, which is when they are mostly nesting or laying eggs. Um, their laying time is anything between April and October. Anything between that range. So typically during the cooler months of the year, with them being ground nesting, that's a, probably one of the reasons why they do it during winter, just because, you know, during the summer we've discussed this, how, how hot the sand can get up to 70 degrees Celsius during a warm day. So, I mean, those eggs will be hard-boiled by the time that they need to hatch if they do do so during summertime. 
But yeah, just beautiful to see these little oaks. Even though they mostly walk on the ground, you know, they, they are quite strong flyers. Finally, we catch up with the Pungwe pack. There's a long lineup for this sighting. And what has made me realize is how spoiled we've all been. We've had them on Juma so much, and we've had them all to ourselves. Now we're on Chitwa. So I got asked yesterday about their territory. They're not territorial, but their sort of home range is very, very large from Bufusuk to Juma to Torchwood and now down to Chitwa. I have a funny feeling they'll be at the dam later, so I think we'll spend some time near the dam, but it's still very, very hot. And for the puppies, I'm gonna try and do another count today, but I keep counting 10. And they're at about 13 weeks now, if not pushing 14 weeks. So normally they suckle for up to the first three months, wild dog puppies, and then they're taught to hunt. So I don't really think they're suckling anymore, and it's a process to be taught to hunt. The adults will still regurgitate. Adults even regurgitate for adults, but it takes time to be taught how to hunt. Just like lion cubs, really, they'll watch, then maybe in a few weeks' time they'll run, and then they'll start to really join in. And what this is sort of based on is observations. They're learning through watching the adults. They'll probably make mistakes along the way. Hopefully it's not fatal mistakes, but they'll learn, and eventually they'll turn into one of Africa's most successful hunters. 80% success rate, which is just incredible. And they do hunt every single day, twice a day, breakfast and dinner. And they require more meat relative to their size compared to lions. So that's why they need to sustain their sort of nutritional requirements by hunting twice a day. Many of you are happy to see them. Oh. The puppies always get up first. And they really, they've grown so much, but they really are small in comparison to the adults when you see them next to each other. And in 2003, which of course was 17 years ago now, the populations in the Serengeti actually went down to 80. It was that critical point. But all of these sort of populations are recovering. They're still Africa's second most endangered carnivore after the Ethiopian wolf, whose numbers are only sitting at 450, which is incredibly low. So the, the African wild dog populations are increasing, but the population in the Serengeti, for example, got wiped out by canine distemper. Completely wiped out. They've been affected by both rabies and canine distemper, and sadly, humans. Oh, that delightful aroma is in my nostrils now. How wonderful. Hopefully, the pack will get on the move soon. Yes, I'm still here in my location. I decided not to move because, you know, it's nice to really see these, you know, youngsters grow. And having seen them since they were almost a week old, it's really, really entertaining to see how busy they are. Yeah, they're really busy. They can't fly at the moment. And here you can tell they are you know, enjoying a bit of the fresh grass, quite busy. There's a lazy one to the right. He's eating while you know, lying down. Yeah, the two, you know, the adults are the second from right and fourth from right. Those are the, sorry, the fourth from right is one adult. Fourth from right is adult, the rest are all youngsters. They have been in this area for almost one month. I'm sure they were hatched not very far from here. These are the kind of eggs that, you know, the, the eggs that, you know, the geese lays are the kind of eggs that when they hatch, the youngsters don't sit on in the nest for very long because because they are threatened by you know young crocodiles like the one we saw earlier very small one so they need to be on the move as soon as possible yes it's quite nice to have shared this moment with them with you guys 
and maybe I will leave them now that I know for sure they're all here and find something else. Oh, perfect timing. Please meet the resident woodpeckers. These look like bearded woodpeckers, but I am by no means a spectacular birder. <coughs> Excuse me, I just choked on air. I hate it when that happens. But um, the other the other one just flew in. So that looks like the male there with a bright red head, and then the females aren't as beautifully coloured, so you would have seen her fly into frame. But they are hacking away a fair amount. I don't think she's there anymore. I think our best bet is going to be that that guy. Not that one. Oh my goodness. Incredible how that uh, woodpecker just doubled in size. There it is. Oh, bottom left hand side of the screen. You got it. There we go. So you can see it just clinging. So very much like the oxpecker foot stretcher uh, that we saw uh, this morning. They're able to grip and hold on nice and tight as they clamber around pecking the wood. Would you like to hear how loud a woodpecker can peck? I hope that you can hear that. Go away, birds. Be quiet. They re oh, so sorry. Unfortunately, the birds here at Prydens don't know how to behave, and the go away birds are now trying to steal this woodpecker's thunder. Unacceptable behavior. But anyways, it's looking in those crevices for all sorts of insect larvae, little beetle larvae or anything like that living in there. There'll be lots of boring beetles uh, that like to live in the wood of knob thorns and leadwoods and those types of things. But it is really nice to just get a quick glimpse of a bird that we often try to put on camera. All right, guys. We're back at the cubs now. Mom hasn't returned yet. Um, and they have ventured out into the open a little bit. And when I say open, bear with me. This is as open as it gets. Sometimes you can see, oh, there's a little stretch. Look at that paw. But yeah, the shadows are creeping a little longer. So they actually moved out of the thick stuff and a little bit more into the open. You can just see two of them there, and there's we can't see the third one, but it's off just to the left hand side. And as you can see, it's still very, very lazy. Uh, you can actually see the the head of the third one just on the top left corner of your screen, just moving where where we were right now. Yeah, I mean, guys, these, these little ones are super, super cute. There you can see the third one now a little bit better now that the second one has moved away. And we're actually quite curious to know when mom's coming back. It would be great to see them, you know, drinking some milk or so. And we're hoping <clears throat> to have her come here while we are here. Because that's also going to be a a good thing for her to see that we're here even though she's not here and the cubs are still fine um there's always that trust relationship that you have to build up with not only the cubs but also the mom and i mean from what we've seen she is very relaxed with us being around here that's always been while she's with the cubs so it would be interesting or, or very good for, for the relationship to have her approach us one time or approach the den side one time while we are actually sitting here. Oh, shame, but these little guys, I think on a warm day like today, they are just lazy, lazy, lazy. How incredible is this? We are looking at quite a few elephants, but you'll see this one here. Look at the shape of the tusks. It looks like the tusks, instead of growing outwards, actually grow in. Um, the one grows in towards the trunk and the other one just um, folds around it. 
There's quite a few elephants in this herd, and uh, if we spend some time here, there's a little baby behind this one. Oh, there it's moving out. Well, it's not as small as I thought, I think because it was slid down into this um, ditch at the back, so we couldn't see the hole or that little one. But look at how it's maneuvering, at that age even, maneuvering that branch to try and strip that bark off. Now, it's a decent sized herd. Uh, when, as we were sitting here, I counted at least close to 15, maybe 20 elephants around. But look at what this little one is doing with that trunk. You see how it's pushing the branch into its mouth and then taking its trunk and twisting it to get the outer bark off from the hardwood. We may not have too long at the sighting. It's extremely busy. There's a lineup for days. Oh, the puppies are getting active. Now, Wild Dog's Latin name is Lycon Pictus. And what this sort of translates to is the Painted Wolf. And lots of people now are calling them the Painted Wolves, especially conservation organizations, because Wild Dog sometimes has some negative connotations. I don't think so. I personally think wild is such a great word, is such a great term. But it does make them sound like vermin or dirty. And that's why a lot of people don't use the word wild dog anymore. Instead, they use painted wolves, but they're referring to the exact same species. And believe it or not, I love the history of the name. In, nine, in 1820, I'm sure it was 1820, Wild dogs were originally called hyena picta. They were thought to be part of the hyena family. Now they're not, they're not at all. The wild dogs are actually the only species in their genus, the Lycaon pictus, the genus Lycaon. Now, it was just originally assumed that they were part of the hyena family, so they were renamed in 1827. So it took 20 years for them to be renamed. <laughs> This one's a very obvious one. You see that sort of area missing out of the top right side of her jaw. I think it's just a skin. The puppies have all disappeared. I think the puppies are going on their own little journey. Yeah, many people are saying you like to call them painted wolves. Absolutely, go for it. It's a beautiful term, painted wolves. And of course, they do look like paintings. And it's just sort of came about because painted wolves have more, well, has more of a sort of positive connotation than wild dog does. But both names are completely correct. But the conservation sort of industry is trying to get people to look at them with in a more positive light. And that's where Painted Wolves comes from. And they are part of the Canidae family. They're very closely related to wolves and their lineages. But many people ask, can they breed with domestic dogs? And no, they cannot. There is no sort of interbreeding between the two. It's not biologically possible. Where have the puppies gone, Theo? <laughs> They've just all completely disappeared. I think they're playing and wrestling just slightly further down there. So we have eight adults in front of us. No, that can't be right. Let me just double check because I've been trying to get a total count for this pack. How's the puppy sleeping? Seven. Seven adults all snoozing in front of us right here. And I'm really convinced they're going to wake up and go straight to the dam. Hopefully all the Anyala are prepared today. They're very sleepy, these dogs. They sleep all day and they sleep all night. So we may not be able to stay here for too much longer, but let's see, and then we will go and visit the dam. Have a look at how this little one is trying 
to strip the bark off that tree. Now it's not as effective as effective as mom, but notice what it's doing. It doesn't even know how to like look like it, uh, how to use that trunk properly. See, I was just trying to grab anything, and I'm trying to break it off. I can't get it, and so like I'll push it into my mouth and then pull it. See, this one is basically breaking everything off with the trunk and putting it in its mouth. Because that youngster um, is still developing that trunk and that skill, it's mainly biting uh, or grabbing hold of that branch with its teeth and then pulling it to break it apart and then chew it from there and then maneuver it with its trunk. Lee, an elephant skin is quite coarse, so if I had to take my hand and rub it over, it feels... Mm, I'm trying to use an example like that we'll probably use every day. So if... Mm, probably the best would be if you like had very, very dry skin. Um, or even if, if you had to, like let's say, around your knee area if you had a very like dry skin there and you had to rub it it's like a very hard feel um and and that's with with uh, elephant if you rub your hand through it it, it feels like sandpaper <clears throat> it's not excuse me it's not really that soft but i'm sure a, a little elephant the skin might be slightly softer but you can imagine with them in order to cool themselves down they gotta flick mud and that onto their backs you'll see it looks like the skin is several sizes too big so that the mud can get trapped there and as it slowly uh, cools down it helps to cool down that body of the elephant and so imagine all the sand that on the body so if you had to go and rub your hand over the back it will be hard um, very hard texture just back at that little one so see how this female off to the left she's so well skilled with her trunk and how to dig out roots, how to use her tusk to break over a tree, maybe even use that right foot to dig. But that little one off to the right still needs a lot to learn. See how she's using that right foot? Now basically what she's doing, she's probably grabbing, grabbed hold of a branch or a small um, tree and she's using her right foot. Oh, it's actually just to loosen the sand to cool herself down. That little one eventually won't get to that size. It might take a few years. No, oh, guys, that's one thing that I do miss about the low felt is being able to see those big gray giants, the gentle giants of the bush, you know, the elephants. But it is just stunning to be able to be out here and looking at these little puffballs. As you can see, sleepy baby still. <clears throat> we'll probably spend about another 15 minutes or so with them. If mom doesn't arrive back, we'll start heading back out to see where her tracks went. And, you know, with it cooling down, she might have gone and lied down in a underneath a tree during the day after hunting this morning or so and we might get her heading back towards the cubs um so it would be nice to see her too but you know guys the, the just the incredible thing about these little ones i mean obviously when they're so small and they're very dependent on their mother and with that being the case the patience that they just show to stay in one place while she is away is incredible. David and I were speaking about that the other day when we were with the lion cubs as well. You know, we, we physically saw how the mom left them to go off and hunt. And without saying a word, she just got up and left and they immediately went into like a little hiding spot. 
and it's just beautiful to witness these things. You know, if you had to think, I I know when I was a little boy, I didn't always do what my dad told me. So <laughs> to have these little guys listen to them, you know, take the orders without hesitant, hesitating about it for one second. It's just crazy how the bush works. That instinct that kicks in. Lazy, lazy little boys. And like I've mentioned previously, on when we've been spending time with these guys, the most exciting part of all of this is seeing... <laughs> yeah, I mean, guys, we're getting a lot of comments about how, how cute they are. Believe me, I have to pinch myself every time we get here just to make sure it is real and it's not a dream. You wouldn't imagine something that perfect being in such a harsh environment. So, so cute. But yeah, what, what I was saying is the excite, most exciting part of all of this is knowing that we're going to be spending some quality time seeing these little guys grow up and just seeing them developing in the cats that they're going to want to be one day. It's going to be incredible. How incredible is the sunset and with these elephants behind it? It was not a sunset yet, but just the silhouette shot of the elephants. Um, and you might even see some of them are flicking sand onto their backs. You might even see that um, cloud of dust. Now, there is a female with a youngster lying down between her legs. Now, we're going to try and see if we can get her. She's round right about there. I don't know if the light is going to be in our favor, but we're going to try. Look under her legs. See the little calf lying down. Let's see now with the mom moving. It's so small. It looks like maybe because mom scraped a bit of the sand or the surface uh, there and so there's probably a lot of loose sand um it must be so nice and for that little elephant look at how he's just swinging his trunk probably trying to get up now might be that he's just using his trunk to flick more sand onto his back but also look at how gently the other ones move past and there's the little one trying to get up so maybe mom will just help nudge the little one up so often what they do is they can put their oh, see how she actually loosened the soil around and see that's why he's enjoying himself like that because she's loosening the soil for him so now it's nice and soft and he's just rubbing his ears and his back into it How incredible was that to watch? And who knows, maybe because she's still doing it, there's a good chance that he might go and lie down again. Now just off to the right from where that mom dug earlier, there's one that's now flicking sand onto itself. So remember that same spot where the little one rolled down. Look at this elephant and maybe because of the light we'll be able to see how the dust goes onto its back.
I agree with everyone. How beautiful is this lighting just? It's hard to describe it in words because it is getting to that time of the day where we refer to it as the golden hour. Just such a golden moment. just see the baby again going back to where the mom was digging now she's digging again let's see if that uh, young elephant is going to go back and lie down in the sand again it's trying to use the trunk as well to loosen it now let's see see mom using that front left foot just to loosen it a bit more so she might even use that to flick onto her back or as we saw earlier that baby would go and lie down in it see how he's trying to splash himself with the the sand now <laughs> it's so quick with that little trunk of his He still needs to go a lot because he's not doing it properly. See how he's only getting it between his front legs, not even all the way onto his back. Wow, look at the size of that elephant in comparison to the mom is quite big, but look at the size of that bull. He is massive. Even though his tusks aren't as, as impressive as most of or some of the bulls you might see, but he is a tall elephant. But an incredible, incredible scene with the light. Coming to you live, live. Uh, it is a quarter past six here in the Mora, and uh, as you can see from on our camera, the highest peak you see over there is exactly where Angama sits, and it's a beautiful sky. The sun is about to disappear on, uh, above the scarpen, which. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, for permission to preposition the car. We need a better, uh, better spot because also lion somewhere down here with the carcass. So we're just gonna try get a better position so that we can have uh, a good view of the lion. Right, so this is a very beautiful sighting this evening. Uh, a young male lion, uh, probably maybe two and a half to three years old, and he seems to be in charge of uh, a family meal. Uh, this is in the heart of Ololo Pride's territory. So the freely ripped of the meat from the carcass, basically meaning they've been spending uh, the entire day enjoying this particular meal and uh, most likely the rest of the pride uh, members could be hiding anywhere behind 
these thick bushes so they're not uh, in our field. It's a young male lion probably having been tagged with the responsibility of protecting the family meal from uh, of the scavengers who will always be on the prowl looking for an opportunity to uh, look at that it's just leslie rolling his belly up wow it's beautiful and uh, as we all know lions are lions are the kings out here in the jungle and uh most other smaller predators do not uh, really have the luxury So most of this, this male is really anxious and is looking at us as we try to get a better post. Oh, right to our left is a female lioness. Archie, can we have the camera on that female lioness? Uh, so it was right. There could be probably more lions in here. Just that we're very, the full, we've got full bellies and then they have been resting just to ensure that they do not waste a lot of energy moving around uh, uh, or as there's a male here that needs to be uh, fiercely and jealously protected from hyenas uh, the vultures we've seen quite a bunch of vultures uh, a while ago and uh, simply uh, uh, waiting for uh, their chance in the pecking order Get a better position of this female or Wow, cool. So this uh, lioness is, uh, will be spending the rest of the night uh, to, uh, taking care of this meal and watching over it, you know, during the night, a lot of things will be happening around here like this. Uh, they do not want to risk the remaining part of the meal, losing it to other potential uh, rifles, uh, most likely hyenas. So where we left off, we had those two black rhino that were walking off into the thicket. And they, we didn't get a better view, so we decided to continue. And we came across this incredibly cute sighting. And I think this we've actually got a baby giraffe. It's just gone behind the bush now, but it is tiny. And what's so sweet is it's been feeding on this bush that you can see right in front. Now, the height of it, I, I estimate when, when giraffe are born, they're already at about six feet, and it, this giraffe's not much taller than that. They're only supposed to be start eating leaves when they're about four to six months old, and I really don't think this giraffe is that old. I think it started a little bit early, probably more mimicking what mom's been doing than anything else. So I don't think it's too much for nutritional value. Well, it, it is for nutritional value, but it's just learning its behavior early from its mother. And what's really interesting is that it has sort of let its mother go off and you can see it emerging from the bush now it's starting to look for its mother who's quite far down the hill normally they don't um, they don't wander off that far you can see now how tiny it is and how incredibly vulnerable something so small <laughs> it's going off in the complete opposite direction <laughs> sorry this is just Yes, those are very cute Aussie cones, very tiny. And what's quite interesting to know about those is that when that giraffe was born, the Aussie cones were not actually fused to the skull. They do drop from, you know, quite a height. And you can imagine dr dropping on the head as they do, it could cause quite a bit of damage if it was fused to the skull. So they actually only fuse a bit later on in life. This little giraffe is very confused. It can't see its mother. I think it's gone around looking for her now. It's 
The mother's actually quite far off to the right. You can see it turning its head, just lifting its ears, trying to catch any sign of her. <laughs> it's got some flies bothering it as well. It is quite a brave little giraffe. Normally they do stick very close to the mothers. In fact, they often you find them right in the middle of the <laughs> right in the middle of the legs. Just because they do, you know, the mothers have to protect them. So the mothers will actually kick out at anything trying to get close to the calf and keep them between their legs if they are if they are in danger of, of other predators. Like I said, this one's quite bold. You can see it's starting to get a bit nervous not seeing mother. I think the big problem is is that the head is about the same size as the shrubs around it. So it's, it's finding it difficult to see over those to spot its mother just down the hill. Ah, I think it's seen its mother now. It's facing directly towards her. <laughs> Don't worry, viewers. I think this will have a happy ending. It's just a, a bit of a curious young animal going off and exploring away from the mother. But it seems to be walking straight towards her now. So I don't think I don't think we'll have any problem. She might just have to scold this little one and teach it not to <laughs> to wander off too much. Actually, it's quite interesting just to see how it's walking as well. You can see how it's rocking back and forth. And it's still, it's still not too steady on its feet. I don't think it's very young, but I, I would age it at maybe about two or three months, maybe just before it's supposed to start eating leaves. Its mother's actually just off to the right, maybe a hundred meters off to the right. Now seems to be going in the wrong direction again. <laughs> I wish I could show this this giraffe straight to its mother. It does seem a bit confused now. Oh, it is, I do love watching young animals. They are really interesting because you can sort of imagine what's going through their mind whole lot of these experiences are the first sort of experiences they have you know this might be one of the first time it is venturing away from them or maybe it's not lost maybe it is just simply a curious young giraffe and it, it's taking its time to to explore the surroundings it's like grooming itself I think earlier it was being bugged by a few flies See how prominent those ossicones and ears stick out right above, right above these shrubs. So we'll stick around. We'll see if this this young giraffe reunites with its mother anytime soon. So okay. We've got a bit more activity here, or actually a lot if you have to take it in cheetah cub terms. As you can see, there's still one of the cubs out like a log here in front. But then that one there at the back is really starting to to wake up a bit, you know. I think she's he or she has slept enough for the day, and he's just now playing with the other sibling trying to give it a kiss, but you know how siblings are. Your sister wanting to give you a kiss and you doing everything to avoid it. Oh my, they're just so cute, guys. I can't get over it. You can just, I mean, that coat at the moment is quite thick and very well camouflaged for a shady environment, but you can just start seeing the little spots breaking through, you know? 
Not that they would be born with without them. Their coat at the moment is just of such a sort. So Anna Marie just had a comment that the mom was has been away for quite some time now and she hopes that she returns soon. Anna Marie, you are right. We hope so too. Um it's not uncommon though for a mom, whether it's cheetah or leopard or lion, during these initial stages to leave their cubs for a full day. Remember, when it comes to hunting, they're not always successful the first time. So they might have to travel quite some distance to get to a place where they can kill something or actually do kill something and only then come back after feeding. So it's it's quite common for them to to leave them for a day sometimes even two during these initial stages believe me when she comes back now these little three little munchkins are going to be very hungry and they are going to have only milk on the brain but it is not an uncommon thing that's why she, the choosing of the particular den site is so important because if she chooses a bad den site, which is easy to discover that cubs are there, and she leaves them for a day, she might come back to an empty house. So very, very important for them to choose the right spot to leave the cubs in. Um, but yeah, we hope that she returns soon as well. It would actually be very good to have her come back while we are still here, just to see that reuniting process happening but yeah as you can see now that it's cooling down a bit definitely a tiny bit more activity as far as the cubs are con well as at least one of the cubs are concerned um always just cute to see them moving and doing all of those things Well, these things happen when you sit and wait at a watering hole, which is my favorite thing to do. 2020 is the year of practicing patience, well, for me anyways. And, well, finally, the breeding herd of buffalo that we see almost every single day have come on down right on time. They like to drink at the golden light. They must realize that it really complements their complexion. Anyways, but you can see them all just uh, bathing in the water. So, well, some are. Some don't want to, want to get their hooves wet. They've already pretty much had a drink. There's still just a couple of bulls coming in, but you can see the bulk of the herd there. They're just sort of standing quietly. And I did hear a whole bunch of birds just a few minutes ago absolutely lose their minds. There's a lot of squawking going on from about three different species, so I don't know what disturbed them. But I did have lion tracks coming in this direction this morning. So fingers crossed that they've just been slowly trailing the buffalo herd because I have not seen lions for quite some time, and I'd very much like to see a lion. That's unusual, because normally in the Greater Kruger, lions are quite fond of buffalo, and that's what they do, especially during these drier periods, is that they will change up their sort of territories, if you will, slightly, in order to follow where the prey goes. But there is one big pride of lions that occasionally pops onto pridelands, but it doesn't seem to be enough. And the tracks that I had this morning were maybe only for two or three lionesses. It was a bit difficult to tell because there were some elephants that walked over their tracks. But anyways, we shall just wait patiently. But I do like how some of the buffalo enjoy going into the water and cooling themselves off while others prefer rolling around in mud. <laughs> now, I believe... A few of you are asking if we can see Tungsten. There he is. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's just a joke. It's not really his name. But it's this buffalo bull that has two specific traits. is that he has his tongue sticking outside his mouth. Uh, some days it pokes out a bit more than others. We actually saw him this morning and he's got a very stumpy tail, as I'm sure you just saw him there swatting. But look at that. He can't pull it in all the way. Well, maybe he can and he just doesn't like it. He wants to be different. It does look a bit strange, though. Hey? I mean, I mean, buffalo tongues seem to be quite flexible from when I've been watching them feeding. And they can 
twist and move them around in all sorts of directions, but it seems to be stuck in a certain way. I don't know if any of you actually agree with me. And it always pokes out on the right-hand side of his mouth. But I've never seen it poking out on the left-hand side. So we don't know what's wrong with him. If it's nerve damage, if he was just born like it, if there was a funny joke yesterday, we'll repeat it. The cat got his tongue. Ha, 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 ha. You know, these types of things. But he's, he's funny. And it's really nice because, you know, the longer you watch Buffalo, you actually realize that they also have their own personalities. We're so fixated on the cats and we don't really spend so much time with the you know the same um buffalo over and over again or the same elephants over and over again but we've really been able to do that at pridelands which is something that i've never been able to do in all my years of guiding so i've thoroughly enjoyed that taking a bit of a back seat from watching the big cats although they are around just not as relaxed as the ones in the sabi sand or in the maasai mara but to get to know different animals instead we've had more togs that we see every day we've got the buffaloes we've got to the elephants of course that is my my absolute favorite but it is such a glorious afternoon here i might even poke my nose behind the damn wall to see if there are any lions welcome back we are still watching this these giraffe the mother is feeding very very calmly her cheeky little calf has gone off and lay in the thicket uh, about 150 meters off to her left just out of view and they both seem quite relaxed so neither of them seems too perturbed i think it does know where its mother is i just think it's quite a curious young little giraffe while we are looking at this female the other day I had quite an interesting question from the viewers asking how many giraffe are there left in Africa and I wasn't quite sure in the answer so I went back and had a look and it turns out there's about 111,000 and two of the four species are fairly, fairly endangered. The one being reticulated giraffe with about 8,700 left and then northern giraffe with about 4,750 left. So we do have some quite endangered giraffe out there. But this we are looking at, this is a southern giraffe and their numbers are pretty stable. Amazing when you have a look at the neck, we always picture giraffes feeding up high in the tree. With regards to calling out to the calf, Giraffes actually communicate uh, via low frequencies, so we can't hear their communication. Very similar to how elephants communicate with those low frequency vibrations as well. It's the same with giraffes. So she could call to her giraffe, we just wouldn't, be, um, sorry, to her calf. <laughs> we just simply wouldn't be able to hear it. I always love watching giraffe feed because they feed so delicately and you often can see that ball of cud going up and down the throat which is always enjoyable to watch. We're going to stick around for a little bit and see if this calf comes back out. So we found three hyenas. Now you'll see these ones are pretty young so the mom's probably the one off to the left there and um, there's some animals moving behind us and also a giraffe probably what gave them a fright that's just moving behind us there's another one on this side we just give it some time and eventually she'll go and settle down again especially with those youngsters around but sometimes they can be very curious see so I know the youngsters look at the size difference between the two also, the youngsters tend to be a lot lighter in colour. Looks like mom might have heard something, so the youngsters are pretty soon going to start following. But I wonder, because this one looks very, very curious, and he's very fascinated of probably what is this thing standing on the side of the road. Eric, you copy Eric? Now, just to give you an idea, we 
we basically moved off to the side of the road and they came closer to where we were so we didn't necessarily go straight towards um, them it's just the youngsters being so curious they just came to investigate to see what this is but eventually they'll lose interest and move off now because the mom moved away see there's a very well-worn game trail at the back there's a good chance that these youngsters might just head back to the den or possibly even go and follow mom the size of this one's feet and the ears. They do look very clean and fluffy, especially in comparison to some of the hyenas we've seen over the last little while. time to move off but in the meantime what I do definitely want to point out to you is so just in front of me on this side there's two spots where you'll where you'll see there's some giraffe in front of us as well yeah back to the Mara and we're still with the elephants around this area. A very cool time of day and they're really enjoying the last bit of light, eating away lots and lots of grass. It's also, it's, that one is part of another bigger breeding herd. Look at that, very relaxed, eating away all together. Yeah, the little one is in the middle, so, so you know that's enough protection you don't want to go through there elephant population in the mara is doing very very well yeah lots of elephants you know in the mara uh, they're doing very very well okay i understand that you guys are yawning to find out about the injured elephant she was treated, like I uh, said um, uh, earlier on, she was treated and then there was a follow-up yesterday to see what she was doing and she is quite well. Today I didn't meet the warden so I don't know, I'll be calling him this evening and tomorrow I'm, I will give you an update. But it was treated previous day, yesterday when I saw it, or I saw it, it was already, it had been treated. And, but they followed up and it was doing very well. They say that it was an injury probably caused by a snare. A snare is a trap put um, outside the boundaries of the, the conservancy meant to catch small game, but sometimes it catches the unwanted um, animals because it cannot discriminate, it is a trap so it can catch anything and uh, luckily it didn't catch you know like a trunk and i'm hoping that that little girl will survive it will make it through they have amazing antibodies so don't you worry and you could tell you know she was walking she was determined to leave and so she will leave but i'll give you an update tomorrow look at that view beautiful that's what you get when you come here what is that Ah, looks like a lion lying down. Wow, well done, James. Yeah, looks like a lioness. She's quite a long ways away. Yeah, it is a lioness. You can see moving. Yeah, look at that. Belly flop. Yeah, definitely a lioness. Yeah, this is the amazing thing about these plains of the Mara. You can be looking in one direction and missing out the next in the other direction. Then the moment you turn, a boom, what you've been looking for, it's all, it's all been there. You are only looking in the wrong direction. We hadn't looked there, but look what we found. 
Looks like she's very well fed. And looks like she's having a very good time. Am I tempted to stay here a little bit and see where she's gonna head? Right now we're sitting here with a bull elephant. Looks like it's one task. One task is broken, probably. Looks like it. And that happens to elephants. Could be male or female, they do lose tuskers. But you know, what happens when they lose tuskers is that tusker doesn't grow back. So this elephant is right here. It's gonna be like this the rest of its life with one tusk. But it's common that sometimes they lose them both. Look how get at that tree out. It's kind of a pull the whole tree. So you see what he was doing next. It, it is awesome. Look at that trunk. This is what the trunk so special about. Holding pulled off. So they Bulls like this, you know, need a lot of food a day. Well, most elephants do. And for them, they have need to spread apart, spread around far from one another so they can able to get enough of what they need. So it's gonna be a little bit of a noise here. There's a car, we're in close to one of the main roads. So indeed, these elephants mix grasses like you see right now, looks like it's going for a grass. And while he was just busy feeding on that wood, most of the wood out here is combritum, which is larger fruited bush willow, most of these nutritious and it's soft wood that I have to peel back on this one, they feed wood and the bark at the same time. But some other big tree which they cannot manage to pull off, you see, sometimes they were just gonna push it down. And also they do peel deep bark tree just for a combium layer. Cling on. Um, a lot of elephants, they're one of the animals that they will take care of each other. I see an elephant separate, and during that separation was a one mother, and a, we thought they were, she had a twins. And the next day, she, when she returned to the particular herd, and we still recognize her that she joined the rest of them, looks like in that particular hour, it was happened, a separation take place. So what they do, they, if that baby still drink milk and she's still gonna accept the baby and they treat the baby as hers. So they don't really do a lot of uh, push one another so hard. It looks like he's gonna come right at us, these guys. So they love one another, these boys. This teenager, they are the one that sometimes can be a little bit of a problem, push their sister so hard in her. But once they get in the age of about 15, 14 years old as a young male, their mother tend to push them away. For that reason, they gotta have to move out, started to move out of the herd permanently. And where they go, they're going to join these bulls where they were able to learn how to forage, how to behave good. And they need to pay a lot of respect to these older ones because now these are the ones who will teach them how to get around. For that, understanding that it's not actually very easy for these, they just push it off.
from their mothers since their age is there for them not to follow their mother anymore because of some reason. And they don't understand. You find them, if you come across this particular herd with a lot of young male follow right in the end, far from the herd as the herd move, it's so that they're still trying to understand or trying to keep up with the herd and then they still don't understand why we not accept that in the herd anymore until they understand well this is, looks like it's going to be life for us we don't have to be in this group look at the round head this is what male elephants always look like and of course female square head but small in size but female they tend to have a huge backside you know as a whole weight it's got to be a lot of have heavy or very strong muscles on the back but now the drone was there see what this drone also do they don't see it's physical on the animal itself they're passion branches look at this bird drongo associate with any animal but the benefit feed insects as animal move this step flies anything bird fly catches it it's a lot of drunk is it in his male he's going to next tree hopefully you get enough of feed before late we're gonna move on leave him alone That's what the buffalo are doing. They're also moving on. Most of them have got out of their version of a swimming pool. You can hear all the adults shouting, come on now, it's getting dark. Well, that's what I could always hear my mom saying. I don't know why we weren't allowed to swim at night or when it was raining. We haven't quite understood that. But anyways, so I think the buffalo are literally going to go back up the way that they came. It was quite funny uh, for a minute when, when they did cross over the top of the dam wall. It reminded me so much of being in East Africa and watching the migration with much fatter versions of a wildebeest and not as athletic. If you thought that wildebeest were not athletic, then you must watch a buffalo try and jump because that's quite comical and they're particularly useless at it. So uh, I had myself and Odie in hysterics for a little while. So I'm quite keen to see how they make it up the slope. But watching them come down was, was quite funny and there was all dust and everything. It was actually quite cool. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But some of the more experienced cows heading up and over, standing and staring, making sure that there's no danger ahead. And then, of course, the rest of the herd follows. It's really interesting to see as soon as one of the pathfinders gets up and decides, right, we're moving, how quickly, with very little vocalizations, the entire herd moves. I wonder if it's visual cues or if they are communicating in a way that we just can't understand probably probably both of them off they go you can see which ones enjoyed the mud oh that one's got a bit of a limp what's wrong with you got a stiff leg did you stand on something funny hmm wonder if it's got something wedged between its hooves bruno yes buffalo can actually swim quite well and the reason why i say this is because <laughs> No one's got caught on a branch. It was hysterical. I have actually watched two buffalo bulls cross the Mara River. I think it was, and I've spoken about this before. I think it was at the cul-de-sac crossing um, in the Mara. And it's very, very deep there. And they swam across perfectly. So they can swim. However, they don't swim very often. In this area, in terms of crossing rivers and things like that, there's absolutely no need. But like we saw, on a really, really hot day, buffalo are not afraid to wade into the water literally with the water right up underneath their chins so they do enjoy that but main, mainly for the reason that they want to keep nice and cool not because they want to cross the other side but who knows if some lions uh, chase them maybe one would go and stand in the middle of the dam although it would be quite deep for for these buffalo because even when the elephants go in a fair amount of the water still covers their bodies. There were a few elephant bulls before the show started today that took the plunge and had a bit of a swim. Now, you've all got to do this one at a time. Now, I've walked across that dam wall quite a few times. It's very narrow in some places. 
like you can see, just wide enough to fit one buffalo. So where they're all gathering there, they have to be very careful because uh, on the other side it is very steep. You wouldn't want to slip because you'd go tumbling on down. There they go, one at a time, following each other. No lions, unfortunately, or yet. Definitely going to keep an ear out this evening and hope that some of the big tawny cats will come this way. Surely the smell of buffalo must be filling the air. Ah, look, buffalo weavers. What a coincidence. And one forktail drongo. That's quite cool. So that's the nest of those birds, but I'm sure most of you know that. Um, so not that one on the left, but you can't see the other one. It's got a bit of white on the wings and has a red bill. And they make those well, very well-designed nests. I think if I was a bird, I'd probably create a nest like that. I wouldn't be able to do anything coordinated. I, I can't even plait, so I wouldn't be a weaver. I feel like you're taking it easy now. I suppose there's no, no point in rushing off. They're probably just going to find a nice sleeping spot because that's what they might do. They might graze. Might graze for a little bit longer and then find a little place. It's not too windy, so I don't think they need to sleep in the drainage line to keep out of the wind. But there's some nice big open clearings to the east and even to the south of where we are. And that's typically where they'll prefer. So I think tomorrow morning on safari, the first thing we will do is try and relocate on this herd of buffalo and see what they get up to. And maybe, just maybe, we will find the lions too. Great idea. You know, I always plan for the next day as we're going to do the same as well. Look for Talamba if she's going to be around first thing tomorrow. And our male elephant looks like it's only one since we get here, and uh, there hasn't been any sign of other one, which means that could happen that you know the other one is still uh, far away where they communicate. Mina um it's a good question that, you know, but I'm not sure if they can tell if it's going to rain. Um, but a lot of time, animals, they have a, you know, kind of, you know, you know, sign of, it's going to sh 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 uh, sign where it's going to rain or not. Especially we've seen cows when they play running around to match this young one pushing one another and the kind of happiness that's going on. But with this such an animal, animal like this, since they don't actually pick up speed like or they cannot really play like most animals, they do. So I, I'm not sure about that. But it's a very good question. So well, I'll find out, you know, it's, you know, you never know. Could be that, you know, it, you know, it happens that they, there is going to be a sign that you tell whether it's going to rain or not by just behavior they, they give. But this, yes. Look, when we get there, he was not actually doing a lot of uh, flapping ears. Yeah, that's all about Drongo, you're right. That Drongo we saw. The other one, if you listen to him, just a second. There was a few birds. It was also a rattling sausage call as well. One of the small birds that was that was also making noises, but in front of that elephant and the drong drongo, they're trying to get as much as they can before dark. And of course, it's getting too late. So, just want to take this time to everyone from World Earth Team, just to thank everyone for their time been with us in this beautiful show and I wish all the best and good night and then tomorrow it's the same things we're able to meet right in the same spot in the same channel thank you so much from us have a good night bye
This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer